tonight on Wings. Take off with the Discovery Channel in the F-14 Tomcat. Today, the F-14 is the aircraft carrier's first line of defense. Celebrated in the movie Top Gun, Tomcats first proved their worth over the Gulf of Sidra in 1981, where Libyan Su-22s proved no match for the swift and agile Tomcats. Tonight, soar high with the F-14 Tomcat on wings. On the 25th of February, 1979, the Russian warship Minsk slipped through the Turkish Straits and into the Mediterranean. Classed as a cruiser to comply with Turkish regulations, the Minsk was nonetheless an aircraft carrier. But its comparatively small size and total commitment to vertical takeoff warplanes gave Western analysts a chance to study Soviet thinking on naval aviation. Clearly, Soviet strategists did not believe they had a need for large carriers able to support a wide variety of aircraft. American thinking, on the other hand, has gone towards the development of massive carriers, often nuclear-powered. These, the largest of man's mobile creations, are able to convey and support several different types of aircraft. Carriers provide the U.S. with the option of sending its potent air power to areas where it does not control airstrips, as was the case in various stages of the Second World War the Korean conflict, Vietnam, and more recently, the Persian Gulf. American attack carrier can only be perceived as the ultimate gunboat. But if an aircraft carrier is to provide the weapons, it is also an inviting target. With up to 5,000 lives and an almost irreplaceable amount of technology, aircraft carriers are vulnerable to aerial attack. To counter this threat, the United States Navy relies almost entirely on one remarkable aircraft, the Grumman F-14 Tomcat. America's involvement with carrier forces is greater than any other nation. It was aircraft from the Japanese Carrier Task Force that devastated Pearl Harbor guaranteeing U.S. participation in World War II.
It was only from the deck of the carrier Hornet that Jimmy Doolittle was able to lead the B-25 retaliation attack on Japan. Although the attack caused little damage, it broke the myth very early in the conflict that the Japanese homeland was beyond Allied reach. The Battle of the Coral Sea again proved the potency of the carrier-launched aerial attack. But it was Midway that was to prove the greatest carrier-against-carrier -carrier conflict. It was the American victory there that would set the trend for the remainder of the war. Midway was to show the strength of carriers. It also demonstrated they were vulnerable from the very type of aircraft they carried. Since that time, it has always been the threat of aerial attack that has been uppermost in the minds of carrier commanders. In the 1950s, the principal threat to American carrier forces still came from the air. Russia had developed long-range maritime reconnaissance bombers, such as the Tu-20 Bear. Powered by massive turboprop engines driving counter-rotating propellers, the Bear was not fast compared to fighters of the time, but could carry supersonic anti-ship missiles, which could be launched with devastating effect. Against this combination of long-range and advanced missile technology, the U.S. Navy had to completely rethink the role of its fighter aircraft. To counter the Soviet threat, the Navy had to develop a very special aircraft, not a fighter in the tradition of previous conflicts, rather a long-range all-weather interceptor. To fill the role, McDonnell Douglas developed the F-4 Phantom II. The F-4 Phantom II was a massive plane for its time. It provided the speed, altitude and range that would keep missile carrying aircraft at a safe distance. Its most important feature, and a break from previous convention, was the use of two crew members, a pilot and a radio intercept officer. The RIO provided the pilot with valuable radar and target tracking information.
The pilot's role was to get the aircraft as close as possible to its prey. Because the F-4 was designed around another revolutionary concept, it had no guns, only radar-aimed missiles. The Phantom not only proved a successful aircraft for the Navy and the Marine Corps, but was also adopted by the Air Force for a variety of fighter, reconnaissance, and ground attack roles in Vietnam. With its Sidewinder and Sparrow missiles, the F-4 was often successful against enemy MiGs, but it had to be upgraded with a cannon for close encounters with the lighter Russian-made fighters, which were more agile and hence extremely dangerous. Intelligence data gathered on the improvements to Soviet cruise missiles and their launch from aircraft, ships, and submarines continued to worry U.S. naval strategists. They knew from their own experiments the devastating effect this new type of weapon could have and asked the obvious question, could an anti-missile weapon be developed? Hughes Weapons Division thought so. They offered the AIM-54 Phoenix missile which, although having the disadvantage of being large and heavy, could lock onto another missile at a range of 50 miles. The problem now was to find an aircraft that could carry the Phoenix and still fly fast over long distances. For some time, just such an aircraft had been contemplated by Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara in a project named TFX, or Tactical Fighter Experimental. Later designated F-111, two versions had been contemplated, the Air Force version and a carrier-based Navy fighter to be given the all-important task of fleet defense. The principal differences in the two airframes were in the forward fuselage, the landing gear, and the wingtip. The shorter forward fuselage on the Navy version would accommodate a folding radome for carrier deck parking. The station geometry, provision for escape, subsystems, and oxygen system are the same in both cockpits and controls, displays, and instrument systems were made common wherever practical. When the wings were swept back, a near optimum configuration for low drag, high-speed flight was produced. Although the TFX project was mainly the brainchild of General Dynamics, most of the Navy's F-111B was subcontracted to Grumman Aviation. The F-111B, while a multi-role fighter, also had to accommodate the massive Phoenix missile. However, because the basic design called for a medium tactical strike aircraft, the overall concept resulted in a plane the Navy considered far too heavy for carrier use. By the time this rare footage of the Navy's version of the TFX was shot, the project had already been abandoned, and the carrier trials were a mere formality. This despite several successful firings of the Phoenix. The principal problem of the F-111B may have been the inability to reduce the aircraft weight below 80,000 pounds. But there were also other problems, including the undercarriage, side-by-side -side crew position, and a general lack of pilot visibility on landing. At no stage was the Navy, with its special needs, optimistic about adopting a fighter, which in every other way was an Air Force bomber. By the late 60s, the Defense Department recognized it had no replacement for the now aging Phantom. Worse still, information was becoming available that Soviet engineers had produced land-based swing-wing fighters with superior performance. The problem was summarized in 1968 by Admiral Thomas F. Connolly. There is the ever-present threat from surface to surface or surface to air missile, from either shore stations or missile carrying Soviet ships. The basic problem is that our stable of Navy fighters 
to meet these threats is rapidly losing its edge. Our F-8 Crusader was started in late 1952, over 15 years ago. It became operational 11 years ago. Our F-4 was a clearly superior fighter when it became operational in 1961. Now the gap is closing. It is a tribute to the skill of the nation's fighter pilots that a high kill ratio has been maintained in Vietnam. We cannot depend on maintaining this margin indefinitely. The time has come to equal the skill of our fighter pilots with a far superior fighter aircraft. One that will be superior now and for the next 15 years. With vast experience gained from the F-111B, Grumman had already made moves to produce a suitable defense fighter to fill the void described by Connolly. Grumman experimented with a variety of models and weapons formats to try and produce a concept that could both act as a dogfighter as well as a fleet defense fighter. Their Model 303 clearly filled the requirement. Benefiting from lessons learned in the TFX program, the new aircraft was to rely upon expensive but proven materials such as boron and titanium. The wing box area was doubly strengthened against failure. Two turbofan engines would provide speed and economy, and two separate fins would ensure aircraft stability should one engine fail. The Model 303 was to carry the widest weapon spectrum of any warbird then in service. It carried an M61 cannon for close encounters and dogfighting. The traditional short and medium range Sidewinder and Sparrow missiles, and the long range, deadly accurate Phoenix. The time I was flying the Phantom, uh, that was considered the world's foremost fighter at the time, and it had served very well in Vietnam, and it was used in a number of uh, other parts of the world. And it was, like I say, about the best all-around fighter aircraft in the world. And so it was really a little bit of a letdown, almost, to go to something like an F-14 that all of a sudden made the Phantom look obsolete. And in that regard, it would out-accelerate the Phantom, it would out-turn the Phantom, uh, it would out-weapon system the Phantom. So everything that we were so proud of our F-4 Phantom for, uh, all of a sudden was left behind in the dust. The concept behind Model 303 would be a lesson to all aircraft builders faced with the problem of having to provide an aircraft that would not only bring them into line with enemy weaponry, but also, because of the cost of development, ensure that a single plane could maintain a competitive edge for years to come. By the 21st of December, 1970, the prototype now referred to as the F-14 and named Tomcat was ready for its maiden flight at Calverton, New York. Test pilots Bob Smythe and Bill Miller had to wait all day for final adjustments. It was only in the late afternoon and with the threat of snow the following day that they finally got aircraft number one into the air. The flight only lasted 10 minutes and was generally uneventful. Both pilots said that the Tomcat behaved well. The next day, the weather turned nasty. It would be nine more days before it was safe to fly the Tomcat again. This time, Miller was to take the front position and Bob Smythe the rear. And the flight was to be anything but uneventful.
Prototype number one had not been in the air long when its chase plane noticed what seemed to be smoke coming from the aircraft. In fact, it was hydraulic oil leaking under pressure. Within minutes, all of the control surfaces of the plane ceased to function as the pilots made their approach through the cold morning air. mere 100 feet from the ground, when there was no possible likelihood that the plane would reach the runway, the pilots ejected. Four seconds later, prototype number one ceased to exist. Here is how it looked from the ground camera recording the event. In late August, another aircraft, originally scheduled as number 12, now redesignated 1X as a replacement of the ill-fated original prototype, was wheeled out of Grumman's Calverton plant. By now, Smythe, Miller, and the other test pilots had established a real affinity for what Grumman was convinced was the answer to the Navy's problem. But other manufacturers and the natural pessimism of Congress had yet to be overcome. And while the Navy had confidence in the Tomcat concept, there were still many trials ahead. Because at no stage was Model 303 to be a cheap aircraft. The sort of money invested and the commitment necessary were already putting Grumman under considerable pressure. Throughout 1971, ground-based testing of the first prototypes continued. These aircraft were put through severe testing when little was known about how they would react. Here is prototype number two with a complete ordnance load achieving the almost unachievable.
Here it is again, affecting an induced stall. Throughout the entire prototype program, several aircraft were made with no intention of ever being flown. Their sole purpose was to be tested to destruction. By this method, it was hoped that any flaws in design or manufacture would be identified. Prior to carrier testing, a prototype was catapult tested at Patuxent River Naval Air Station. And on June 28, 1972, the first Tomcat flown by a Navy pilot landed on the aircraft carrier Forrestal off Norfolk. After a series of touch and goes, the landing was affected by aircraft number 10. But within minutes, a small malfunction appeared. The two pilots were informed of a leak in the hydraulics of the nose gear. On hand as a minor adjustment was made was Bill Miller. faces of the Navy's test pilot said everything, because this film of the first carrier landing was to be flown to the Congressional Committee for a final decision on the Tomcat within hours. As it happened, the committee gave the project full endorsement, but elation at Grumman was short-lived, because just 24 hours later, Bill Miller's luck ran out. Flying this same aircraft, he made a minor technical oversight that cost him his life. You bump into a lot of situations out on the carrier where there is not a cut and dried set of rules and there's not a cut and dried set of policies that say the carrier guarantees me that I will have these conditions on landing. You're going to go out there and you're going to fly and when you come back you're going to look for where the carrier is supposed to be regardless of where they told you it was going to be. You're going to look for where it really is and then whatever the conditions are you're going to land on it. If you come back and the weather doesn't suit your minimums it really doesn't matter. That's the only place you have to land. And so therefore, you may have to bend the weather a little bit. Uh, that doesn't happen often, but it is, it's, it's an example of the, the, the sort of difference that you see between the way the Navy has to operate and the way the Air Force has to operate. By late 1972, full-scale production of the F-14 was in progress. The Tomcat was no longer a prototype. It was now the Navy's fighter of the future. The spectacular firepower of the F-14 was spotlighted in Operation 6 on 6.
Operation 6 on 6 demonstrated the effectiveness of the Hughes Phoenix missile system by attacking six different targets at one time. Three air launch drones represented enemy fighter aircraft at supersonic speed. Three obsolete training aircraft represented larger enemy bombers. And one Mach 2 land based drone represented a launched missile. They were sacrificed in the cause of presenting the Tomcat with an array of targets. With a Navy crew at the controls, each of the six targets were individually identified on the radar scope and allocated a Phoenix. One time, all six missiles were in the air, streaking towards their individual targets. Only four of the six targets were destroyed, but this was due entirely to a malfunction in the two drones. The information collected proved conclusively that even under six to one odds, the Phoenix Tomcat combination had a success rate of 80% or better. The first two carrier-based Tomcat squadrons were the VF-1 Wolfpack and the VF-2 Bounty Hunters. With their induction, the Navy now had in one plane an answer to the missile threat and an advanced dogfighter. Every landing is a new experience, even for veteran pilots. Placing 80,000 pounds and $40 million worth of high technology onto a few hundred square feet of deck takes its toll on men and machinery alike. Undercarriages and airframes have to come to terms with phenomenal stress. 
and sometimes not always with the desired result. Here, a Tomcat hits the deck of the Forestall, and the landing gear gives way. Still containing fuel and probably armament, the aircraft effectively blocks the landing approach to all other aircraft and must quickly be removed. A gantry hoists the crippled plane up for removal. Firefighters and medical teams stand by as the entire complement is well aware of the devastation an exploding aircraft could create. Finally, the plane is secured, a source of jubilation to at least one member of the deck crew. The Tomcat's major role should never be considered as an aircraft alone. It is a combination of airframe, avionics, and missilery. The components come together to form a lethal package, a complete weapon system. The F-14 carries the Phoenix missile as one of uh, three missiles that it can carry. It carries the, uh, the Phoenix, the uh, Sparrow missile, the Sidewinder missile, and then it has a, an internal gun, has a Gatling, Gatling gun cannon that the F-14 carries. So it has a very wide range of missiles. The Phoenix is the, is the weapon system, is the missile that really gives the F-14 what's called a fleet defense capability, where it can, can really augment the, uh, the capability of the carrier to defend itself. Miramar Naval Air Station is fighter town, home of the famous Top Gun Fighter Pilot School. Here, crews are given the opportunity to pace their F-14s against aircraft from aggressor squadrons. These aggressor aircraft are specially modified to resemble the flying characteristics of potential Soviet adversaries. Here, a crew flying a modified A-4 Mongoose pits its skills against the crew of an F-14 Tomcat. Although only an exercise, the doctrine of these engagements is train like you fight, fight like you train. But the Tomcat's also made to win when the game is real, as it was over the Gulf of Sydney in August of 1981. With the carrier task force testing Gaddafi's line of death in the Mediterranean, tensions were high. On August 19th, the patrolling Hawkeye detected two fighters traveling at high speed towards the carrier John F. Kennedy. Two patrolling Tomcats were sent to intercept. At the controls of one was Commander Larry Muzinski. First thing on the second morning of this exercise we were doing, they came out and approached us head on. We had them in radar contact the whole way. And uh, as they were approaching, we didn't suspect any particular problems. But then as they were approaching us about a mile away, their lead aircraft fired uh, what we believed to be an atoll heat-seeking missile head on at us. And we just evaded that missile very quickly and turned around and went on the attack. Uh, which our rules of engagement at that time, President Reagan had just changed the rules of engagement, said if you're ever fired at, uh, you can return fire and protect yourself, and we'll talk about it later, which is exactly what we did. We passed them head on at about 600 miles an hour, uh, did our 7G reversal turn and got behind them, and my commanding officer who was flying the other aircraft shot one down, and I shot the leader down, and the whole thing from the time they shot till the time we had both of them down was 44 seconds long. There was no reason to suspect that anything like that was going to happen that morning, but it did. And therefore, you do revert into this reactionary mode and you start thinking, okay, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, the next step, the next step, the next step, and you do it. And we did everything we had trained to do. The results were exactly what they were supposed to be. You didn't have time to get nervous because things were happening so fast when it was over with done with, we joined back up together and we're heading back for the ship, then the adrenaline high started wearing off and literally got so uncontrollable, the shakes, everything like that, just had to reach down, click on the autopilot and let the autopilot fly the airplane back up to the ship for about uh, 15 minutes while we just all calmed down. assistance of fleet refuel, American carriers can be replenished and kept at sea for months, enabling naval strategists to bring aerial firepower within range of trouble spots anywhere in the world. 
the Second World War, Korea, Vietnam, Libya, and now the Persian Gulf have all demonstrated the importance of this flexibility. But it's only with the Tomcat that the Navy can be sure that its floating runways are impervious to attack. have to be able to function at combat status in any climate and in many environments. As Tomcat pilots would say, it's anywhere, any weather, any time. Mm -hmm. 